Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students, I am Professor Vageshwari Deswal, a Professor of Law at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. We will be discussing the course Substantive Criminal Law. Today we will be discussing Lesson 1 with the co-title Introduction and Essential Ingredients of Crime. So in this lesson, First, I will introduce you to the subject. Thereafter, we will discuss some of the important terms of criminal law that is wrong, offence and crime and how these terms they are different from one another. Then we will try to understand the difference between civil offences and criminal offences. Thereafter, we will discuss the changing dimensions of crime and then what are the essential ingredients of crime? So let us begin with the introduction to this subject. The subject of crime is as old as mankind itself. But it is impossible to define the term crime with perfection. Why? Because it is, has got such varying content. So it is practically impossible to come up with a precise definition of this term crime. Russell in his book on crime says, to define crime as a task which has so far not been satisfactorily accomplished by any writer. In fact, criminal offences are basically the creation of criminal policy adopted from time to time by those sections of the community who are powerful or astute enough to safeguard their own interests, security and comfort by causing sovereign power in the state to repress conduct which they feel may endanger their position. So when you analyze this definition, you understand that crime is the creation of the state. Now this should not be taken to understand that crime is created by the state. See when we say crime is the creation of the state what we mean by this is that what is a criminal act and what is not a criminal act this is something which is expressly defined and explained by the state. It is not your or my conceptions of what is right or wrong that will determine whether an act is criminal or whether it is not a criminal act. So it is the state that has to tell us categorically that see this is acceptable conduct and this is unacceptable conduct and this is something if you do this it will amount to a crime and you can be punished for the same. There is a Latin maxim, I will be writing it, it is uh, nullum crimen sine lege. What this means, this is a Latin maxim, which means there cannot be a crime without law. That is, what is something that has been expressly forbidden by the law? So till the time the law does not expressly forbid me to do something, till that time that act is not a crime. So this is there cannot be a crime without law. Similarly, from this maxim there flows another maxim which is, uh, nullum poena which means there cannot be punishment without law. So unless and until I do something which is forbidden by the law I cannot be punished by the state for doing that. So the word crime owes its origin to the Greek word Krima, which means 
offense against the community rather than a private or a moral wrong. So, a crime is the offense against the public at large. And some writers trace the origin of this term to the Latin root cerno, which means to decide, to resolve or to determine. So, whether a given act or omission constitutes a crime does not depend on the nature of that act or omission. It depends on the nature of legal consequences that may follow it. An act or omission is a crime if it is capable of being followed by criminal proceedings. Now let us try and understand the difference between a moral wrong and a legal wrong. See, these are two terms which cannot and should not be used interchangeably. See, what is wrong morally, it may or it may not be a legal wrong. Similarly, an act which has been uh, declared to be a legal wrong by the state may or may not be morally wrong. So, let us try and understand what is the difference between these two terms. So, acts that are repugnant to morals are known as moral wrongs, whereas acts that are contrary to the law of land are called legal wrongs or offences. In order to constitute a legal offence, the act must be an act declared to be an illegal act or an illegal omission either under the civil laws or the criminal laws. So, you see offence is a broad term whether you do an act which is a civil wrong or a criminal wrong, offence is a broad term that covers anything which is forbidden by the law. So, it is a legal term. Then coming to moral wrongs, see moral wrongs may or may not be wrong morally. For example, A knows that B is innocent and that B has been falsely implicated in a crime arrests him under orders from the court. Now, why does he do that? Because he has been ordered by the court to go and arrest a person. So, although he knows that the one whom he has gone to arrest is an innocent person, but it is his legal duty to arrest that person. So, what he has done? It is a moral wrong, but legally it is correct because it was something that he was expressly enjoined by the law to do. Then coming to legal wrong, an act which is legally wrong might sometimes be morally correct. Nevertheless, if it violates the laws, it would be regarded as a legal offence. For example, a person goes and rescues a prisoner whom he believes to be innocent from the prison. Now, it is not that the person has not been conclusively determined by a court of competent jurisdiction to be an innocent person, but there is one person who believes that, okay, this person is innocent. So, what does that person do? He rescues that prisoner from the prison by breaking the prison laws. Now, what he has done is morally correct. He did that thing because he believed that what he was doing was morally correct, but what he has done is a moral morally correct act, but what he has done is a legal wrong. Then see, law does not punish uh, uh, for morally wrong actions unless they also amount to legal offences, whereas law prescribes punishment for acts violating the law irrespective of whether they are morally wrong or not. So, when we talk about moral wrongs, what are the examples that come to our mind? Like if you disrespect your elders, that is morally wrong. If you tell lies, if your parents expect you to perform certain religious practices, but you do not want to do that, so it is something which hurts them. So, we can say that maybe morally that is wrong. If there is a sick person, there is someone who is infirm, who needs your help and you ignore that person. So, these are all actions which we can say are repugnant to morals. So, they are all moral wrongs, but you cannot say that they are legal wrongs. See, unless and until there was a legal obligation on you. See, I will give you an example. Your granaries might be full and your neighbor might be dying of starvation.
Now here you are under no legal obligation to provide food to your neighbor. So if your neighbor dies of starvation, you are not to be held legally liable for the same, although morally your own conscience might rebuke you. That see, you did not take care of someone whom you could have taken care of. Similarly, if see, you see you are a seasoned swimmer and you see a person drowning in a lake and you don't do anything to help that person. Now here it might be an act which is repugnant to your morals, but can you be held legally punishable for that? No, not unless you were legally obliged to save people from drowning in that lake. Suppose you were a lifeguard or you were a coach who was on duty there. And if you don't perform your part of the duty by rescuing people who might be drowning there, then we could say that what you did was a legal wrong also in addition to being a moral wrong. But then anyway, whether your act is morally correct or wrong, irrespective of that, unless and until you do something that you were not supposed to do under the law, the law will not hold you guilty. Let me give you another example. You uh, know that this person is a black marketeer and he has stolen money from all the poor people. Now what you do? You break open his safe, you take out the money and you distribute amongst the poor people. So you feel that what you've do, done is absolutely correct. It's okay, morally you uh, feel that, I mean what I have done is something which I should be rather applauded for. But legally that would amount to stealing. So this was about moral offences. If we talk about legal offences, what are examples of legal offences? Like defamation, theft, murder. So all these are legal offences. What is the punishment that one can get for moral wrong? It could be like maybe you could be rebuked by your elders. Uh, there could be a social approval. But it is not something which is prescribed by the law. Whereas when you commit a legal offence, when you commit a legal wrong, so you might be asked to compensate the aggrieved party, you might be asked to pay fine to the state, you might be in extreme cases sentenced to imprisonment also. Now from this uh, figure you can understand clearly that what amounts to a wrong or an offence and a crime. So you see the outermost circle that is talking about wrongs. So now everything that is covered under all three of these that would amount to a wrong. Now it is only wrongs of a higher category that would amount to offences. So you see wrongs may be moral or legal wrongs whereas it is only legal wrongs that amount to offence. And amongst those offences also, it is only offences which are of a grave character, which have the capacity of creating an alarm and scare in the society, which harm the public at large. It is only those offences which are termed as crimes. So in this figure, it is only the innermost circle that is talking about crimes. Okay. Another side you can see there are two maxims mala in se and mala prohibita. So mala in se means an act which is so wrong by itself you don't need a law to tell you that okay this is something that you should not be doing. See everybody knows it is wrong to steal, everybody knows it is wrong to kill another person. So these are such acts which are wrong by themselves. You don't need a law to tell you that okay this is something which you should not be doing. Whereas when we talk about mala prohibita, now these are acts which have been termed as wrongs. Why? Because the law has expressly forbidden these acts. Okay, Like if you are going somewhere and you see that there is a red light but there is no traffic coming from either side and you jump the red light. Now it is an offence irrespective of the fact that anybody was harmed because of that. Why? Because it is an act which was forbidden by the law. You are supposed to wait at the red light. So you see sometimes regulatory offences such as traffic violations 
or when we talk about building rule violations, suppose there is a permission to construct only four floors and if you construct fifth floor, now that is an act which has been prohibited or expressly forbidden by the law. So, these are offenses which are offenses by because the law has expressly forbidden you from doing those actions. So, those are known as mala prohibita. Now, let us try and understand what is the difference between these two categories of offences, one which falls under the category of civil offences and the other one falls under the category of criminal offences which we call as crimes. So, a civil offence is an offence which is acting against one particular individual, which is affecting one particular person. Whereas, a crime is an offence against the state. So, civil offences they are known as private wrongs, whereas criminal offences they are known as public wrongs. Why? Because they affect a larger section of the society. So, civil wrongs affect a particular individual and they do not affect the community as a whole. Whereas, crimes they affect the community as a whole although victim is a particular individual. See, if A stabs B, here the victim is only B, but the act of stabbing is so severe in itself that bystanders, uh, strangers, anyone who hears about that, everybody would be scared that oh, these kind of acts they are happening in the society. So, it is the responsibility of the state to ensure that everybody's person and property is protected and that is why acts of dimension which have the capacity to create an alarm or scare in the society, they have been forbidden by the state and they have been termed as crimes. So, civil offences they are tried in civil courts, whereas crimes are tried in criminal courts. In torts, proceedings are initiated by the aggrieved party, whereas in crimes, the proceedings are initiated either on the basis of a first information report or a criminal complaint. But in either case, prosecution proceedings are conducted by the state always. In civil wrongs, the objective of law is to redress the grievance by putting the person wronged as far as practicable in the same situation as the person would have been had the offence not taken place against him in the first place. So, the objective of civil offences, the objective of civil law is redressal of grievances, it is restitution. Whereas, the objective of criminal law is to punish the wrongdoer. Why? Because under criminal law, it is the responsibility of the state to maintain peace and security. So, the wrongdoer is to be apprehended and punished as per the law of the land. In civil offences, intention of wrongdoer is immaterial. So, even if I did not have the intention to cause harm to a person, but if my act has resulted in that harm, what the state says is that I am supposed to redress that person to compensate that person for the wrong that has been caused. What is important is that some legal right of the affected individual should have been violated and then cognizance is taken. Whereas, when we talk about crimes, intention plays a very significant role in determination of criminal liability. A person may be punished for doing an illegal act with a wrong intention even where no harm results from that act. That is the reason that an attempt to commit a crime is also punishable per se, even if the attempt has not succeeded, no actual crime has taken place, no actual harm has taken place against a person, but an attempt to commit a crime is also considered as a crime because what would have happened had the attempt succeeded? then some harm would have resulted, but the harm did not result. Why? Because the attempt was stopped because of some supervening circumstances. 
So, the wrongdoer had the intention, he had the preparation and he also did some act towards the commission of the offence which could not succeed due to some supervening circumstances and that is why it is not a crime but an attempt to commit a crime. So, an attempt to commit a crime is also a crime and it is also punishable per se even without proof of any actual damage having taken place. In civil offences, no benefit of doubt is given to the defendant. Whereas in criminal cases, the burden of proving guilt of the accused and that too beyond reasonable doubt, it lies on the prosecution only. And whenever there is any doubt, the benefit it goes to the accused party because there is a cardinal principle in criminal law, let 99 guilty men go free, one innocent should not be punished and that is the reason why one who is to be held guilty, it is the responsibility of the prosecution to prove the guilt of the accused person beyond reasonable doubt. If there is even an iota of doubt in the minds of the uh, court, then the benefit of doubt it will go to the accused person. Now, let us talk about the changing dimensions of crime. See, different civilizations have different notions as to what constitutes criminal behavior and sometimes their own notions may also change with time. Like in India also, if you see some acts which were previously regarded as pious or rightful are now regarded as crimes when the law has declared them to be so, whereas some acts uh, which were earlier considered as criminal in nature, now the state has decriminalized them. For example, if we talk about the social practice of dowry system, if we talk about sati pratha, in our country earlier these were considered to be praiseworthy, but now we have got legislations which have expressly declared these practices to be criminal in nature. Like dowry has been prohibited by the Dowry Prohibition Act and Sati has been forbidden by the Commission of Sati Prevention Act 1987. Now, why was this done? See, in view of the changing realities, it was seen that these practices they had assumed monstrous and socially damaging dimensions and that is why these had to be curbed. Similarly, there was a social discrimination that was practiced earlier on caste basis. Child marriages used to be conducted. Uh, Devdasi system was the norm in many states of India and there were many such other practices also which were earlier considered as non-objectionable. But now the law has declared to them to be criminal acts and they are now punishable under the law. On the other hand, there are certain reprehensible practices such as if we talk about the concept of marital rape, we all know that it is something which needs to be criminalized but the state refuses to criminalize but then we have uh, decriminalized consensual homosexuality. See, before we got this judgment in Navtej Singh Johar versus Union of India, even consensual homosexuality was a crime under section 377 of the Indian Penal Code 1860. But now it was, it has been watered down and now consensual homosexuality is no longer a crime. So you see what is a crime is determined in the light of the dominant ideology of the state and also as per the changing needs of the society. Now, we will move to the next leg of our uh, chapter which is what are the essential ingredients of a crime. So, students there are four essential components of any crime. They are human being, actus reus which is the physical component of the crime, mens rea which is the mental element of the crime and injury. So, now let us discuss these essential ingredients in detail. First is human being. So, it is only human beings that are capable of being convicted for commission of a crime. 
non-human beings such as animals, they are incapable of having rights or corresponding duties as they cannot be compelled to fulfill their duties, nor can they fight for their rights, although they may be the bearer of certain interests and those interests they need to be protected under the law. So you see animals because they lack a moral agency, they do not know what is right and what is wrong. So as it is you cannot hold them responsible for a wrong that is committed by them. So that is why, see I will give you an example. If you have a pet dog, if your pet dog bites someone, can we put that pet dog on trial? Can we hold him criminally responsible? The answer is no. But of course there is a legal obligation on you to handle your pet carefully. So if your pet bites someone, you can be held liable under the Indian Penal Code for negligent handling of an animal. Okay. Now this was about uh, non-humans, then there are certain human beings also who cannot be held criminally responsible. Here I am talking about people who are suffering from unsoundness of mind or those who owing to their immaturity of age or understanding like infants or young children who are incapable of knowing the nature or circumstances of their actions. So now those category of humans they are also excluded from criminal liability. So it is only adult sane human beings who can be the subject of a crime and who can be held guilty for commission of a crime. So you see a human being should be there who should be under some sort of a legal obligation to act implying thereby that there should be some legal duty and not only a moral duty upon a person to do or abstain from doing something. So unless there is some legal obligation upon a person regarding some act or omission, he cannot be held liable under the law. Then there should be a human being who is capable of being punished. See if there is an animal, if there is an infant, even if we punish them for doing something that they have done which is against the law, would that serve any purpose? The answer is no. Because see non-humans, children, they are incapable of understanding the consequences of punishment or even understanding that they are being punished at all. So punishment is not going to serve any purpose in cases of persons who are suffering from unsoundness of mind or persons who are incapable of understanding what they have done is wrong or contrary to the law. Similarly in cases of animals. So that is why punishment can be given only to those people who are capable of knowing and understanding that it is a punishment. And why they have been given this punishment? Because they did not confirm with the prescribed legal code or conduct or they did certain acts that were contrary to the law. So the first essential ingredient of crime is human being. The second component of crime is the physical component which we also call as actus reus. So actus reus is the physical component of a crime. It includes acts that are contrary to law. Kenny defines actus reus to be such result of human conduct as the law seeks to prevent. The human conduct may consist of commission or omission of certain acts. There is a maxim actus me invito factus non est mens actus. What this means is that an act done by me against my will is not my act at all. See we will talk about this. We talk about actus reus. This is the physical component of an act. Now for actus reus there should be either an illegal act or an illegal omission. Now what is an illegal act? When you do something that you should not be doing under the law or when you do something that you have been expressly forbidden by uh, the law from doing it, that is an illegal act. And what is an illegal omission? When you do not do something that you were under a legal duty to do 
or when you omit to do something that the law had expressly enjoined you to do, so that is an illegal omission. So the word act includes omission. So it could be either an illegal act or an illegal omission. But what is important is that it should be a voluntary act. The maxim which I just now discussed, actus me invito factus, non est mens actus. That is an act done by me against my will is not my act at all. So voluntariness is extremely important to constitute a crime. If somebody puts a gun on my temple and asks me to break open a lock, now that is not my voluntary act. I was compelled to do that act because I was under a threat to my life. So that act, although it was done by me, but it cannot be attributed to me. Why? Because the element of voluntariness is missing. Then illegal act or omission, it could be a single act as well as a series of acts. So when we talk about the act of slow poisoning, which requires the accused to administer uh, measured doses of poison to the victim over a long period of time. So whether you have administered one dose or five doses, it could be a single act, it could be a series of acts. Similarly, when we talk about omissions, if you don't feed someone whom you are legally obliged to take care of, so whether you starve a person for one day or for five days, but an act which should have the capacity of resulting in some substantial harm to that person. So it could be a single act, it could be a series of acts, it could be a single omission as well as a series of omissions. But what is required is that the accused should do either an illegal act or an illegal omission and it should be a voluntary act. So students, you see that for actus reus what is important is one, illegal act, illegal omission. It could be a single act or a series of acts. Similarly, illegal omission could be a single omission as well as a series of omissions. But what is most important is that it should be voluntarily done. That is, it should be a conscious willful act devoid of any external influence such as force or fraud. I will discuss a couple of cases here. Now there was this case in which a woman she was being starved by her husband and mother-in-law. What they would do? For days altogether, they would not give her anything to eat. And then on the fourth or fifth day, they would give her a morsel or two and a little bit of water. So that was just sufficient so that she would not die. But slowly and slowly, she was becoming very, very weak. Now one day she found the doors of her room open because she was always kept locked inside her room. So one day finding the opportunity she ran out of the house and somehow she managed to reach the hospital. So when she reached the hospital, the doctors immediately, they hospitalized her, they put her on a drip and they also sent for the magistrate because they felt that this woman was so extremely weak at that time that she could collapse any moment. So that is why they felt that maybe we need to record her dying declaration. So the magistrate came and in the presence of magistrate this woman narrated that see I have been starved for so long by my husband, my mother-in-law and I have been subjected to regular beatings also by them. Anyway, as fate would have it, this woman she survived. So the case came up before the court for attempted murder. Now during trial the charges were that the husband he had failed to provide uh, his wife with food. So the husband said that see she is not a little child and it is not my responsibility to spoon feed my child. But the court came down heavily on the husband and said that Okay, it is correct that it is not the responsibility of husband to spoon feed the wife, but at least she should have been provided for. And it is not that she was free to have food in the house. When you locked her inside the house, when she was not allowed to move outside of the room, when she was not allowed to access food, in such a situation, if you have systematically deprived her of her food, that amounts to starvation and the husband and mother-in-law, they were held guilty for attempt to murder. Similarly, there was another case in which 
uh, the grandson, he was to inherit his grandmother's property. So the boy, he wanted to kill his mother-in-law. Okay. So what he did, he would give a slow uh, a poison to his uh, mother, in, uh, to his grandmother, and he would administer cyanide in very small, measured doses, to his grandmother, so that slowly and slowly she would weaken and eventually die. Now, in this case also, this boy he was held guilty for attempting to kill his grandmother. So, this is how it acts. It need not necessarily be the penultimate act. Okay, it could be one act, it could be a series of acts. Similarly, to constitute actus reus punishable under the law, it could be a single omission as well as a series of omissions. So, that is a very essential component of criminal law. But then, there are certain crimes which are punishable even without proof of actus reus or even without proof of actual harm. And what are those crimes? They are known as inchoate crimes. See, exceptions to actus reus are inchoate crimes. Inchoate crimes, which are also known as incomplete crimes. And what are the inchoate crimes? They are abetment, conspiracy and attempt. These three crimes, they are known as inchoate crimes, which are punishable even without proof of actus reus. Now, coming to the next ingredient of crime, after human being and actus reus, the next ingredient of crime and which is the most important ingredient of crime, in fact, which is the distinguishing feature of crime is mens rea or the mental element of crime. So, mens rea is a Latin term which means guilty mind. It has also been defined as a blameworthy condition of mind. See, mens rea is the most important distinguishing element of crimes which attaches great importance to the state of mind of the accused person and this state of mind of the accused person should exist at the time of the commission of the crime. Now, that is what is known as mens rea. There is a common law maxim, actus non facit reum nisi mensit rea. That is, no act is a crime in itself unless done with a guilty mind. That is, for crime, what is necessary is there should be actus reus and there should also be mens rea. So, these are the two essential ingredients of crime. That is, no act is a crime in itself, that is actus reus is not criminal in itself unless it is also accompanied by a guilty mind that is the mens rea. So, what this means is the act is not guilty unless the mind is guilty. So, no act is criminal by itself. So, when we talk about mens rea, see it is very important to understand that higher the degree of mens rea, higher the culpability or criminality which is attracted to an offence. Mens rea for the purpose of affixing culpability has been broadly defined into several degrees. Because if a person does a crime with a higher degree of mens rea, what that means is this person should now be punished with a higher punishment. Whereas, if the degree of mens rea is lesser, the person can maybe escape with a lesser punishment. So, what are those four degrees of uh, mens rea? The highest degree of mens rea is intention, intention. Now, whenever we talk about intention, it is the highest degree of mens rea because it is indicative of the purposefulness behind any action. That is, if you deliberately, if you purposely do an act, so you cannot have any excuse later on. Now, you have done an act, you did that intentionally. 
whenever there is an intention, there is a design, there is a purpose behind that action, which means that whenever there is an intention, knowledge is always implicit in that act. So, when you do an act, despite knowing what the wrong consequences are and you do that act with a wrong intention. So, that is something which cannot be excused at all under the law and that is why intention is deemed to be the highest degree of mens rea for which the highest degree of punishment is prescribed under law. Next comes knowledge. Now, when we talk about knowledge, now see knowledge can exist with or without criminal intention. So, when knowledge is existing with criminal intention, that is obviously to be put under the first category because when intention is there, that is the highest degree of punishment that is attracted. But if knowledge exists irrespective of the criminal intention, see if you know that this is some act which will cause damage, but that is necessary in order to prevent a, a bigger damage. Or sometimes what happens that you know that it is something which can even cause the death of a person. But unless and until you do this thing, there will be many other people who will lose their lives. Okay? Or maybe it is a risk worth taking. So, in such cases, even though the accused has the knowledge, but the accused does not want the forbidden consequences to ensue. So, that is what is known as the second degree of mens rea for which there would be a lesser punishment under the law. Next would be negligence. See, in law, every person is presumed to know the nature and consequences of his or her actions. See, if I do something, I am supposed to know what I am doing. So, if I am aware of the nature of my acts, I should also know what the reasonable and probable consequences of my action can be, what all it can lead to. See, unless and until I am a person of unsound mind, I cannot take the plea that see, uh, this is an act which I did, I knew what I was doing, but I did not know what the consequences would be. If I stab a person with a sharp knife in the abdomen, I cannot say that I knew that I did not know that it is something which could be so damaging to a person. Okay. Because you have to know, if I know the nature, I know that this is a weapon of offense that I am using, there is a specific body part that I have aimed at, there is a specific force that I have used while stabbing that person and later on if I want to take that plea, that see I stabbed this person, but I did not know what it would lead to. So, the law is not going to accept my defense. So, whenever a person does anything knowingly, when you are aware of the nature and consequences, there is a bare minimum degree of care and precaution that the law expects each and every sane person to exercise. So, whenever the act of any human being is found to be lacking in respect of that due degree of care and precaution, that is known as a negligent act. Okay. So, negligence is want of due care and precaution. And the fourth degree of mens rea is recklessness. This is in fact a higher degree of negligence wherein the person knows that see forbidden consequences can ensue, but the accused is overconfident. Okay? He believes that maybe I have taken proper precautions and nothing wrong is going to take place, but the confidence is misplaced or when there is a mental indifference to obvious risk. So, that is a higher degree of negligence which is known as rashness. So, when a person does a wrongful act intentionally, that attracts the, higher, the highest degree of punishment. When it is not covered under intention, but knowledge was there, because knowledge is something which see a person cannot deny. Why we use knowledge to affix liability is for a Prosecute, uh, for a prosecutor, sometimes it might be very difficult to prove the intention of the accused person. Obviously, the accused is not going to admit before the court that he had any criminal intention. So, in such cases, how do you affix liability on the accused person? So, if you are not establish, able to establish the intention, but if you can establish knowledge, which is comparatively easier, 
Why is establishment of knowledge comparatively easier? Because if the prosecution can establish that the person was a person of sound mind and the person did this act voluntarily, so it means that the person knew what he was doing. Because knowledge is something which we can presume. We can presume that every sane person is aware of the reasonable and probable nature and consequences of his or her actions. So, in such cases what can we do? Even if we are not able to prove the intention, at least we can convict the accused person with the help of knowledge. And then if we are not able to prove intention or knowledge, but if we are able to prove negligence, if we are able to prove recklessness, if the prosecution can prove, see the accused did not exercise due care and diligence which was expected of any normal person. It means the person was negligent. If the prosecution can prove that, see this person, he was totally indifferent to a risk which was obvious. We do not say that he had a criminal intention, but he should have been more careful. So, in such cases the accused can be convicted with the help of the degree of mens rea which could be negligence or rashness. See, I will give some cases to explain these degrees of mens rea. See, there was this case in which uh, the uh, deceased person was a money lender in a village. Uh, so, he was not a very popular person because he would charge heavy uh, interest on the loans which he would give away to those poor the villagers of his own. And then what he would do was that he would uh, pressurize them to repay that money and then uh, keep on uh, I mean, uh, the interest would keep mounting and it would become practically impossible for the people to repay the loan. So, that is why this person, he was not very popular amongst the villagers. What happened one day during harvesting season, he had built a small room within his fields and he had built a, a roof of thatch and all. And what he would do after working in the fields whole day, rather after supervising the work that was being done in the fields, he would sleep in the single room hut at night. And he had also kept a servant who would uh, safeguard the hut uh, uh, from outside at night. So, one day what happened? Four people from the nearby village, they came. They locked the door of the room from outside when this person had retired from the night. When the servant, he tried to intervene, these people, they beat him and they drove him away. Thereafter, one of them, he poured some petrol over the hut and another person, he lit a match and he set fire to the hut. Now, what happened? this hut started burning and this accused uh, and this deceased person, he started crying out for help that somebody should help me. So, his servant, he tried to help him, but these accused persons, they did not allow the servant to help him. Then the servant went to get some more villagers, but these accused persons by the superior force of Lattes, they did not allow any other villager also to come to the help of this man who was being burnt alive inside the hut. Okay. This person, he succumbed to his injuries eventually. Okay. So, these accused persons, they were tried for the offence of murder. But during trial, these accused persons, they took the plea that see, uh, we did not intend to kill him. Okay. What they said, one of the accused said that see, my intention was only to lock him inside the room. The other person said, my intention was only to set fire to the hut. My intention was not to kill this person. But see, the act of theirs when taken conjointly, the act is speaking for itself. When you know a person is inside the room, you lock the room from outside so that the person he cannot come outside and then you do not even allow anyone else to rescue him and then you set fire to that hut, it is obvious that you wanted to kill that person. So, in such cases intention of the accused persons is very, very clear. Intention is clear from the facts itself. So, in such cases the kind of plea that the accused were taken that I did not intend to kill, I just intended to confine him inside the room or I just intended to burn the hut irrespective of who was inside it, such kind of pleas they cannot be accepted by the courts and all of them they were held guilty for killing this person. Okay, then when we talk about knowledge, see sometimes what happens, a person might not intend to commit a crime, but the knowledge is something, something which we can attribute to every sane person. Okay. 
So this is an old case in which there was a young girl, a 16, 17 year old girl who was married and who had a small baby. Now she wanted to go and visit her parents. But the husband was uh, like, you know, you will not go and visit your parents. Now is not the time. And in case you step out of the house without my permission, so I'm going to beat you. So this wife, uh, she was quite adamant and she wanted to meet her parents. So what happened? Despite the refusal of her husband, she waited for the husband to go off to sleep. At night, she picked up her baby in the arms and she set out towards her parents' house. Now there was one single route that this girl knew about and this was alongside the railway line which used to pass through their village. So she took her baby in her arms and she set out for her parents village. After some time when the husband woke up he realized that the wife was not there and he had every reason to believe where she could be. So he immediately set out after her. Okay. When he went to some distance he saw that the wife was moving alongside the railway line along with the baby in her arms. So the husband started running after her. When the woman saw him coming, she heard certain footsteps. She turned around and her worst fears came true. She saw that the husband was following her. So she also started running. When the husband started running faster, she started running even more faster. And she panicked at that moment that if he catches up with me, he's going to beat me. So in that state of panic, when she was running away, she came across a well and as the distance started to close in, she panicked and she just jumped inside the well along with her baby in the arms. Okay. After some time, she was taken out of the well. But in the meantime, her baby had died. Now this woman was tried in the court for killing her child. Okay. So this woman pleaded that see I did not intend to kill my child. And this was a plea which was rightly so accepted by the courts also. See from the facts it is very clear. We cannot say that the woman she jumped into the well with the intention to kill her child. Can we so say so? The answer would be no. But still the fact remains that she jumped in a well with a six month old baby in her arms. Now being a mother was she not aware of the fact or can we allow her to deny knowledge of this fact that exposing a six month old little baby to such a peril would not be extremely harmful for the child's health or would not be extremely dangerous so as to cause the child's death? See, such a plea cannot be allowed to be taken. So knowledge is something which can be imputed to the mother. And it was with the help of this knowledge that this woman, she was convicted. Okay. So it was held that she knew. But see, she had an excuse. What was the excuse? And the excuse was that she was in a state of panic. So that is why she was held guilty for only culpable homicide. But she was convicted with the help of knowledge. Then coming to negligence and, rack, and uh, rashness or recklessness as we put it. See, if you are driving a vehicle at great speed, see there is a speed limit prescribed for roads and that is depending upon the quality of the road, whether it is single lane, whether it is double lane, you know, and what is the quality of the road, is there proper traffic lights, uh, uh, is there proper barricading, how much of uh, uh, traffic volume is there on the roads, depending on that. See, on highways, there is a higher speed limit. So one is supposed to adhere to the law and adhere to those speed limits. But if you drive beyond those speed limits, your act can be deemed to be negligent. So if you are driving at, say, a highway which prescribes a speed limit of 80, if you are driving at, say, 100, 120, your act can be said to be negligent. But if you do the same act on a busy road, in the middle of a market, Outside a school, when the school is closing, okay, not, uh, not closing rather, when the school, uh, when the students, they are leaving the school after completing their business of the day. Or if it is being done, if you are driving at an extremely high speed outside a hospital. So now this is not an act which can be called as a merely negligent act, but this is what is known as an outrightly rash act. Okay, you are fond of uh, what we call as shooting. Now, if you practice shooting uh, in a blank, uh, in what we call as a, in an empty ground, okay, 
and if you have taken all precautions that is fine, but if you are doing that close to a habitation, now that is obviously a negligent act and if you are doing that in middle of a market, that is again what is known as a rash act. So you see there are these four degrees of mens rea on the basis of which we prescribe punishment, higher the degree of mens rea, higher the degree of punishment or criminality that would be attracted to that act. So, there are three essential ingredients of crime that we have discussed so far, human being, actus reus and mens rea. And then in cases of mens rea also there are certain exceptions to mens rea. What are those exceptions? One is strict liability crimes. These are crimes which are punishable irrespective of the proof of mens rea. Okay, this is usually in regulatory crimes or sometimes offences which have been expressly stated to be strict liability crimes by the statute. So, in such cases we can do away with the requirement of mens rea. So, after the three ingredients of crime, now we come to the fourth ingredient which is injury which has been defined under section 44 of the Indian Penal Code and section 2 clause 14 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. The term injury has been defined to denote any harm whatever illegally caused to any person in body, mind, reputation or property. So, there should be some kind of a harm whether it takes place against the mind such as if some person is being subjected to mental cruelty, any harm that is being caused to the body such as a hurt, grievous hurt, any harm that is being caused to the reputation such as if we talk about defamation or any injury to the property such as it could be theft, it could be defacement of property, it could be trespass, any kind of a damage to the property. So, it could be any kind of an injury, but some kind of an injury is required to constitute a crime. So, students that will be all about uh, introduction to the subject of crime and the essential ingredients of crime. Hope you enjoyed this lesson. Thank you.